Hello and welcome. I'm Blanca Vergara from Parenting the Gods. Thank you. Uh, here nice we to have a, a brand new guest. I'm really delighted. He's Dr. Donaldson. Welcome. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Uh, this is a very delightful guest. Uh, to start with, is a gentleman. We have been uh, having a series of ladies, so you bring something uh -huh. special. So that's terrific. <laughs> Uh, this man uh, is a scientist, and his scientific work, his work, is everything about play. Right, right. And you know how he calls play? He calls it original play. We are, we are going to know more about it later. But this man travels all around the world talking about original play and actually playing. And he plays with children of all sort. <laughs> He's going to tell you the diversity of children. I want to create a bit of suspense so that people are, uh, are curious of, uh, of your work. And yes, uh, as I said, that he travels all around the world. He travels really all around the world. He is now in Sweden. And, uh, you know, you can find him in uh, Bahrain. You can find him in Poland. You can find him in the United States. Is it's just a delight. He's a really international scientist. So, and he's been working on this for the past 40 years. So I am absolutely delighted to have you here. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Terrific. We are really so excited to, uh, to welcome you with this subject of original play. Uh, give us a... a uh, an introduction of what is that? What is original play? Well, I use the, the word original because when I started to do this, I realized that it had nothing to do with what I thought play was. Adults, all of us, have ideas about what play is. When, and so when we see kids playing, we're already convinced we know what it is that they're doing. And I was the same way. I turned out to be very wrong. I had no idea what kids were doing when they were playing. Um, I use the word original because I think what the kids taught me, and that's an important point. This is play that kids taught me. It's not play that I taught kids. And what they taught me turns out to be a pattern of connection, a pattern of loving, that's known all around the world, regardless of culture, regardless of income, regardless of gender, uh, regardless of even species. So they taught me a way of connecting, a way of, of belonging to all life. And so I thought, wow, this is, this is not cultural. This has nothing to do with being a human being, even. This has to do with being alive. And I consider it a, a gift from creation to all life. And so original seemed to be the appropriate word, that it, its origin is life. Yeah. Origin of love. Can you give us an example? How does original play look like? If you imagine in front of you now, you had like 10 or 15 little puppies and kittens. And they were all just being with each other, playing, you can imagine what they would look like. That's what it looks like. This Whether I do it with kids or lions or dolphins, it's all the same thing. Huh. It's, it's based on touch and touch that gives two messages. You're lovable. There's nothing to be afraid of. So that's what those are the messages you give or are given when I play with kids, when I play with animals, and that's what the kids give me. And that's why it was so surprising. I had no idea that that's what happened in play. I thought play was contest behavior. How did you get into this subject? What brought you there? Um, basically, it was a need for money. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm trained as a university professor, and I left my jobs, and I became a California surfer, um, but I realized that that wasn't going to last me my life, so I needed, I needed to figure out how to earn money, but I, and I wanted to be with people who were learning, 
because that was my whole field as a university professor. And I thought, well, if it's not the university, where is it? And then the answer was obvious, go to preschool. Oh, okay. So I went to a preschool and, or a school and asked for a job. <laughs> and of course, the director said, what's your experience? And I didn't have any, none at all. I'd never been with kids. I didn't even want to be with kids. So I didn't know what to do. Um, he gave me a job as a teacher's aide, which lasted for a week. How old and, were you? Um, I'm sorry? How old were you then? Oh, about 30. And he said, well, Fred, this isn't working out. We like you, but we don't know what to do with you. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. So all of a sudden, and I had no idea where this came from, I just said, I'll be a special teacher in play. And he said, okay, do that. Well, we didn't know what it meant because I just made it up in my head. There was no job like that. So Monday came and I didn't know what to do. No one knew what to do with me. So I sat on the floor. Ah, oh, fortunately, the children knew what to do with me. <laughs> and they just started to crawl on me and jump on me and go all over me. And then I thought, oh, that's my job. I'm a giant teddy bear. And that was it. And so for five hours every day, five days a week, I was a living giant teddy bear. And I, every day after school, I took notes because that's how I'm trained about what was going on, what did I notice, what did I feel. And after some months looking at my notes, I saw patterns, which is the whole idea of science. You look for pattern. I never thought there was pattern in children's play. I thought it was random stuff. Well, one, there were three patterns that I noticed right away. How kids use their eyes, that they can communicate with eyes that they know how to play. Second pattern was touch, that in play touch starts on the hands and the feet and it moves up the body. So it doesn't, you don't touch the head and face until you have a lot of trust. Wow, I didn't know that. And the third pattern was really hard for me to understand. And that was their play had no contest in it. That means no winning, no losing, no blame, no fault, and no revenge. And I thought, can't be. Doesn't make sense. This, is, this isn't real. These are really weird kids. And I... So I kept playing for months, years, and it was all the same. And I thought, oh, I need a bigger test. Maybe this is just a problem or an issue of the kids in this one school. Maybe it has nothing to do with kids. So the test I gave myself, because this was Southern California, I was going to go to Tijuana, the Mexican border town, and just find street kids. So I crossed the border, looked, walked around Tijuana, and I would find groups of street kids just hanging out. And I'd get, I wouldn't talk to them. I'd get down on my hands and knees and crawl to them. And when I did it, they jumped on me, played with me, just like the kids back home. No aggression, nothing. And I thought, oh, wow, how can that be? Normally, these kids treat gringos like me, like beating them up. But they didn't do that. Nothing, at all, no aggression at all. And we couldn't talk to each other. And I thought, wow, I don't, I don't get it. This doesn't make any sense at all to me. Um, the pattern was getting bigger, but there was no logic to it that I could figure out. So I came back to the States and played with every kid I could find. Gang kids, kids with schizophrenia, autism, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, they all played the same. But, you know, this, uh, this weekend I had uh, an experience like, like you with, uh, with children, a seven-year-old and a three-year-old together. The seven-year-old uh, is a, a son of a couple who has marital problems. Uh -huh. So there is a lot of aggression in that child. 
And the little three years old is a, a happy-go-lucky child. And uh, there is a lot of love in his house, so he's, he's just lovely. And the seven years old kind of tried to bully him. Yeah. And the little one kiss him. Uh -huh. Kiss him again. <laughs> hug him. And like you say, uh, I started touching him more from uh, uh, from hands to uh, mm -hmm. the face. And the bully just changed. Yeah. So I tell you this story to, so that you tell me how these children teach others to play and what's the consequence, what is the social consequence of this? Because I think it's huge what you're doing. It, well, the social consequence can be just what you described. So one individual changes another individual. For example, I was playing with um, gang members in New York City. And one of the gang members took me aside and said, Fred, I need real help. Every time I'm in school, and he's about 17, 18 years old, and anybody touches me, I hit him. And I'm tired of it. I don't know what else to do. It's a reflex. And I said, okay, come with me. So I, gang members, and I asked him if I could push him. And he said, yeah, that's okay. So I did it and nothing happened. And I said, well, can I push you harder? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. So I pushed him harder. And as his reflex was that he threw his right punch right to my face. And as it came up to my face, I caught it and held it on my chest. And we sat down, and one of the other gang members said, Fred, did you see his face? I said, yes, I know. He was crying. Because what happened in a split second, his whole world of self-defense and fighting cracked open. And he asked me when we were done, oh, Fred, can I learn to do this with kids? And I said, yeah, that's why I'm here. That's what this is about. Um, so sometimes it just... The human being has a has a an experience so that what they thought was their only choice turns out to be not their only choice. And they have within them a choice that's much safer. And for him it's much safer. Yeah. So and with gangs, street kids, men and women in prison, bullies, victims, what I'm telling them is that we have a choice to be safe in the world. That we have an alternative outside of aggression and victimization that allows us to be safe even in with aggression. So even if somebody's aggressive with you, like the example you gave of a little boy, that's the response I learned from kids. And I had no idea there was that kind of choice. But the more I played, the more they taught me a form of touch and a form of emotional connection to that touch that keeps me safe. I mean, if it weren't for kids, I'd be dead now. And that's reality. That's just real. Yeah, it's just real. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, I would love you to tell us about uh, your, your recent experience. You went to a country full of violence and uh, it really touched you. Share, yeah. share with us, where was that and what kind and of circumstances? In, I went to play in the Syrian refugee camps in Lebanon. Um, I've never been, I've been to Bahrain before, but I've never been to Lebanon. And uh, we drove to the camps with a woman who works there and I just started walking through the camps and no one knew me. And obviously everyone knows by looking at me that I don't belong there. <laughs> that different from other people there. I didn't talk to anybody. I just walked through and as I would walk through, I would look at kids, smile at kids. And I went to a big open space and got down on the ground. And I just was there. And kids started coming around me and not knowing what I'm doing or who I am. And I would crawl to them and start going at them and they they would <laughs> run away and giggle and laugh and come back and within a half an hour i had 20 kids on top of me just not talking just playing 
And the more they played, the more kids came. The adults could see that something strange was going on in camp. What is that? All these kids on top of this white guy. Um, and at first, parents would say, "Well, no, no, um, it's okay. Get you know, keep him safe. Be." And I say, "No, that's fine." So more kids would come, and then mothers would come and bring me their babies to. And in the whole time, no one talked because I don't speak. Um, I only speak English. And the kids knew just, you know, a little bit, like, how are you, and hi, but we couldn't really talk to each other. Not necessary. It wasn't necessary at all. So we spent um, three days playing with uh, the kids in uh, three different refugee camps, a hospital, and an orphanage. And what struck me was that the ability of the kids, and this is what I find all over the world, that no matter what's happened to them, their ability to give and receive love is right there. It's, it's not hidden. It's just right on the surface. If you provide the opportunity, by that I mean uh, mm, make, make myself accessible to them. Not standing up, being on the ground, knowing how to hold my head, what to do with my eyes, how to touch. They respond immediately to that everywhere in the world. Um, I've done it in the Philippines and Singapore and South Africa and Namibia, favelas in Brazil. And it's just amazing to me. I, I, um, it's, it's a sense of loving beyond all knowing. I, mean, I, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, the best English word I know is grace. That's the best word I know of to describe what the kids give me from around the world. Um, one little boy in Poland, after playing with him and his father, um, said to a, a therapist friend of his um, that he had been playing with me. And she said, well, what do you want from him? What do you want from Fred? Uh, he was having trouble with bullying at school. So she assumed she wanted he wanted me to teach him what I do with bullies. And he said, no, that's not what I want. I said, well, what do you want from Fred then? Well, when Fred plays, he has an angel on his right shoulder, and he's surrounded by white light. That's what I want. That little boy changed my life. I mean, my whole life is different. Um, I learned a long time ago that kids can often see and hear things. We can't see and hear. And I know now what's kept me safe for all those years that I never knew because I would be in so many experiences that didn't make sense. You know, well, why did I come out of that alive? What's, what's happening here? I don't understand this. Well, I think it, I was using the wrong kind of understanding, the kind of understanding that's very consistent with the university background. And that, that's not all understanding is. So what the kids did was, it's like taking me and saying, Fred, you know, the world is bigger. The world is more real than you think it is. Really? Yeah. And we're going to show you how real it is. Oh, geez. And that's what I think happens. Um, I, I sometimes think there's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> between God, children, and animals. And they say, uh, God says to them, you know, we have this poor guy down on earth, and he has such a small idea of what's real. He needs help. Who volunteers to help him? Well, the kids raise their hands, and the dolphins raise slippers, and bears raise paws, and they all come down and, and help me with my small idea of what's real. And they literally <clears throat> exploded. And don't give me any, any boundaries. And I said, oh, wow. What do I do with this? And I don't know what to do with this. Except included in my life. Um, the, the Syrian kids in Lebanon, given what they've gone through, of, of having to leave their homes in Syria, and the villages, 
and coming to a not just a, a different country, but not even coming to a home. And they don't even know when or if they ever go back home. And yet their ability to immediately give and receive love from an absolute stranger it was just wow. overwhelming. I, I, I love how you say that uh, God, the children, and the animals are in this conspiracy to expand your world. And I think they are in this conspiracy to expand the world of adults because I feel the same uh, since I became a mother. I, uh, uh, I've met other children as well because it's not my children that are uh, this way. It's all of them. And uh, yes. then I, I, I would like to ask you that the bridge to the, uh, because of course your work is so powerful that touches children in extreme situations like these children in, in war situations or in gangs. But it touches, of course, the situation of the, the, the let's say, normal child. Uh, right, right. Uh, I don't know, uh, how would you like to, uh, to answer? Well, From your own perspective as a father? Yes, that changed my life. Um, because I started to play with my kids when they were little. And I think one, it changed my priorities as a father. Um, for six years, I stayed home and raised my kids. I took care of the house and the cooking and the kids and all of that stuff that normally in America a woman does. But wow, that was the best six years of my life. Um, and I learned how to incorporate play into life in a family. Because normally I would just think, oh, well, we can play on Saturday or we can play when all the work is done. But we had this some kind, and I have no idea where this came from. But in our family, we had a kind of pattern that if we walked by and touched each other, you know, just on the shoulder, on the back, it meant play right now, right here. <laughs> And so often my job was to cook dinner, and my daughter, a 10, would come behind me and touch me, and that meant play right now, right there in front of the stove. <laughs> so I learned I can do that. I just turned the stove off, got down and played with a 10 in the kitchen on the floor. Now, a 10 never wanted to play for half an hour. She has all kinds of things she's doing. So she would play for five minutes and then run off. And, and what I realized, if I changed the word play to love, it changed what I did. Because in, in my background, if I think the kids want to play with me, then I say, okay, we can do that on Saturday. We can do that after homework is done, after my work is done. Well, every adult knows that our work never ends. Absolutely. I mean, it just goes on and on forever. But what, what she and my her brother forced me to do was say, wait a minute, this is not about playing. This is about loving. I can do that right now. And that's the most important thing in the family. So it changed the entire structure of how we organized family life. Um, we used to have one Saturday every every month called Play Day. And from when we finished breakfast until dinner time, that's all we did. No TV, no computers, no phone calls, nothing. The four of us were together the entire day, just playing with each other. And no balls, no games, no just with each other. Um, neighborhood kids used to come over and say, well, when is play day? We want to join you. <laughs> um, it was a remarkable um, thing. They, they taught me to give love now. They taught me that time was important, that I always had time to love them, no matter what um, was going on in the house. Um, It changed who I was as a father in terms of how I settled conflicts with the kids. Um, I was a better listener. And each time there was a 
a, an apparent, ooh, what, what could be called a major issue, I stopped to think first before I talked. And I found out that by thinking and listening, what I thought I needed to do, I really didn't need to do. So it stopped a lot of, um, we didn't have punishment in the family. We, we didn't, nobody punished anybody for anything. Um, there were tests to see if I really believed it. Well, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really um, fortunate and thankful for my kids' um, training of me. Um, once my, I was playing with the two kids on the front lawn and my daughter, she was about five, ran in the house crying. And I thought, oh, gee, what did I do? So I went in and asked her, because I thought maybe I hurt her physically. But that wasn't it. She said, Fred, you don't play with me like you do Anthony. Anthony is her brother. He's two years older. Yeah. And I thought, well, what does that mean? What is she telling me? Oh, then I realized I played with a 10 like she was a girl, which meant that I backed off on energy. I didn't give her the energy she could handle. So what she said to me is, you don't trust me. Oh, my God. That was an incredible blow to a father. Oh, geez. But it really taught me that in play, you don't treat a girl as a girl. You treat her as she is at this moment. Same with a boy, the same with a lion, the same with a baby. You don't play with categories like daughter and son and girl and all those. You play with the being that's right in front of you. And when you do that, they can feel the trust and the love. If not, they can tell that you're just playing with a category and you're really not there. It forces you to be present. Absolutely does. And when you begin to have that habit, like I was confronted with that habit every day, all day, it becomes a new brain map. You have a, literally a new brain and behavioral habit that's developed. Um, one psychiatrist said to me, Fred, you've played so long, you've changed your brain. And I believe that. And that ultimately, that's where original play goes. So on the one hand, it's extremely important in a family, in relationships between father, mother, and the kids. And it's important in the relationships of like gang kids, refugee kids. And it's also important at a huge level in allowing us and training us to become the humans we're meant to be. Um, give, us some, uh, give us one actionable tip. How can uh, moms and dads can do this? I think one of the most important things is to use a loving touch that says, as a mom and a dad, the touch you give your child says two things. You're lovable. There's nothing to be afraid of. And you do that throughout the day. Just um, in my family, we would walk by each other and give each other a little hug on the shoulders and keep going. Or we hold a hand. Um, and we used to play with my kids every night before bedtime. So it, one, you make a special time, that's your own time, with no technology. Cell phones are off, not just over there, but off, completely off. Computers off, TV off. And you're just together as a person, two people, three people. Whether you take a walk, whether you cuddle, whether you read a story, what you do is not important, but it's the, it's the sense of being together, the sense of touching each other. And when you do that when kids are little, there's absolutely no reason that that touch should or needs to stop all the way through. You don't, I never had any problems with touch with my daughter when she was a teenager, when my son, when he's a teenager, you touch them the same way. 
because it has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with loving and safety. So that doesn't change. And your whole life doesn't change. So it, as a parent, at some point as parents, we are going to be the people that need the love from our children. If we don't teach them how to do it, we can be kind of lonely. So it, it all comes around. If we present and give to kids the kind of loving, safe touch when they're young, when they're teenagers, and as they grow up, then that touch turns around and comes back to us. And we need that. The, everyone in the family needs that of whatever age. Absolutely. It just never stops. That's right. never stops. Yeah. Um, you know, the, one of the things that I love of her, what you do and what you have been saying is the equation work, play, and love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, and I certainly never, before I started playing with kids, play to me was never love. It was contest behavior. It was winning and losing. I didn't know anything, anything else. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it took a while. Um, and over and over, I remember um, the, reason, the reason that I'm still doing this has to do with a little boy uh, when I first began. I started teaching kindergarten after I started to play. And in my class was a little boy with leukemia. His doctor said he shouldn't play because if he gets too tired, his immune system will go down. So moms told me, and I said, okay, I'll pay attention. I'll take responsibility at school. So I did, and it meant that I had to include him, but in a ways that didn't make him tired. Well, about six months into the school year, he came and said, Fred, I'd like to have a meeting with you and mom and dad. He's four years old. So we had a meeting, and he said, I want to play with Fred. I know I'm not going to live as long as the three of you, but I want to live my life as if I were. Oh, wow. wow. You can imagine what it felt like in that room. We had three crying adults and a four-year-old therapist. <laughs> oh, for real. He went and sat in each of our laps, and he held us. And I don't know how we decided because we never talked the rest of the day. But it was clear Paul could come and play. So he came and played. And when he came to school, he played so hard, he couldn't come to school the next day. He could only come every other day. And in a month, he died of leukemia. At the funeral, mom and dad and I talked. And we asked each other, did we do the right thing? And we agreed it was okay. It was right. And I realized when I went home that night that Paul taught me many things. One was trust. It wasn't that he trusted in me or mom and dad or himself. Some of us would say he trusted in God. He lived life as if the whole point of life was trusting. I'd never been with a person like that. Wow, and he's four years old. Another thing he taught me was that he knew what he was doing. Paul chose to play and die rather than live and not play. When I realized that, then I understood what the kids are teaching me. This is not about fun. This is about loving. Loving so deep that you give your life for it. It's a service to life. And that little boy changed my life, like all of them. And if it weren't for Paul, I wouldn't be doing this. Um, because when it gets tough, and it can be tough, and especially in America, to be a man who plays with kids when the play is touch. Americans don't value, really have a hard time valuing kids, and we're deathly afraid of touch. Um, but it's so clear to me that those are key things allowing us to be fully human, that we have to go by the get by our fears and that's what the kids have done to me Absolutely. That, that i find that really interesting because then it's uh, uh, all the cultural understandings of why the original way of loving the original way of playing is wrong uh i recently met a, a 
don't remember that the, their nationality was a, a Nordic lady and uh, her daughter wanted to play and the mother was really proper move that direction your fingers are dirty and uh, and the girl is being programmed to that's not okay and the mother is not allowing the uh, the learning um we don't allow being dirty we don't allow uh, getting down to the children that's right um uh I don't know, maybe uh, if possible, because you have been telling us so beautiful stories. Can you tell us another story on this subject of uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, cultural differences and the connection with uh, uh, the subject that is original play? Yes, um, I often visit South Africa. And one time I was asked to come to a school in a black township. And I first walked out on the playground and just sat on the grass. And of course the kids saw this strange white guy sitting on their grass because that's not something white people do there. So all the kids on the playground ran over to see who I was. And their favorite thing to do was to, was to touch me. And they would, they would put their fingers on the top of my head and press down and laugh and go get up their friends. So I had these 200 kids pressing on my head and I couldn't figure out What's so funny? What are they doing? Oh, and then I realized this is South Africa in the summertime, and my bald spot is sunburned. And when they touch it, it goes from red to white. <laughs> and these kids have never been that close to a white guy to do that. So in that whole group of kids was one little boy, smaller than everybody. It's like he even didn't, he was too small to be at the school. He came and he sat in my lap and he just hugged me. No talking, nothing. And all the kids went back into school and he stayed there. He stayed in my lap and just hugged. Um, after a while, it was time for us to go in. So he went in, I went in, and a teacher who watched me through a window said, well, do you know about the little boy who was in your lap? I said, no, I don't know anything about him. She said, He's only been at school for a week. He was found a week ago, tied up in a black plastic bag and thrown in a pile of trash. And I, I turned away and I thought, I don't, I don't even know how to think about that. I, I can't even begin to, that that's like some bad TV program, yeah. movie. Um, then I thought about him And I thought about the courage and what he did. He walked out and sat in the lap of a strange white guy he's never seen before. And all he did was love me, nothing else. And literally his whole being just said to me, Fred, do you have the courage to love me back? That's what he asked, not with his mouth now, because he couldn't speak. English and I could, certainly couldn't speak Kaza or Zulu or whatever language was native to him, but we didn't need that. Um, and I realized, wow, that's what every child asks. Fred, do you have the courage to love me back? And that's the message I think if I had one message from every child in the world to every adult, do you have the courage to love me back? And whether the ch children are like my, my own kids in my own house. Um, that took restructuring our family. It took restructuring what I thought was my job as a dad. It re took restructuring my ideas about punishment. It takes restructuring of who we think we are as human beings, as parents, as teachers, therapists, um, corporate people. Uh, men and women in politics, the United Nations. Um, we just haven't done what's necessary to make um, Earth um, a thriving place for children. And they, they keep giving me the same message <laughs> all over again. Um, and wow. <clears throat>
but this right. thriving it's a, it's a thriving place for humans because i think the others also need the love <laughs> yes and that's what the kids give me you know sometimes when i walk away from the little boy in, in south africa or the um my own kids or the the little boy in, in california with leukemia i i feel fat like they they filled me up with love on this big balloon filled with with love and no expectations no conditions do they put on it it's just done I was, wow that's so incredible that that life gave us such a gift um and i feel so incredibly fortunate that that somehow the kids pulled me to the ground and said hey get down here we have something to give you well okay um and i you know i looked back now for 40 years and i really don't know why why this happened why would i go to be with kids in a school when I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to play. I didn't even want to be with kids. I wanted to teach university. I didn't understand what was happening to me. Um, I spent a whole year crying every day because I couldn't figure out why am I doing this? Nobody believes me. I can't earn money. This is really stupid. <laughs> But, what is your current answer to that? The only thing I can think of, the only answer I have is grace. That somehow my life was being planned outside of me. That somebody, something knew what was happening and I just needed to trust. And it wasn't trust in me because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, it was trust in, in something beyond what I knew. And that trust has um, born uh, reality. That it's real. Then um, it just keeps coming. Um, I was in Poland last weekend at a foundation for adults with autism. And I saw an interaction between a young man and a young woman with autism that even while I was watching, I cried. I just was stunned by their ability to touch in such a gentle, responsive way that I just, everybody in the room, just their jaws opened up and we just watched and no one talked for five to 10 minutes. And I said, and all the research on autism says? No possible. I know, and here it was, I couldn't believe it. That's love, that's grace. Uh, it, it, To, to, bring te to bring tears to my eyes after I played for 40 years with humans with autism all over the world, it was stunning. Um, and I said to myself, we really don't know a lot about what it means to be human here. Okay. And when I think of, of Gandhi's statement about love being the strongest force that the world possessed, The kids keep showing me that Gandhi was right. This is it. Oh. oh, this is just so uh, exhilarating. I, I, I'm so excited talking to you, and uh, I bet that uh, people are also. But uh, uh, we're reaching for uh, the top of the time that uh, allocated to work together. Uh, for this time, because uh, I guess that people would like to uh, uh, see you and, and listen to you again. So... Uh, I will dare to ask you the last question, to ask uh, your intuition. The last thing that uh, uh, our mothers and fathers of, uh, uh, of, who are listening to us right now need to listen from you, need to hear from you. I would say the most important thing is stay in touch with your kids. And I mean really in touch. Every day. And that touch, you've got to communicate To them, you're lovable. There's nothing to be afraid of. And that comes right back. 
you cannot believe how thankful I am to, of this conversation. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's inspiring to me personally. And uh, 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 I bet that everybody who's listening is inspired. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. So, uh, people out there, if uh, you like this conversation, that uh, certainly I did, I am uh, really touched, yeah. just click there, like it, and, and share it with everybody. You know, now it's so easy to share. Use all your social media, send it by email. Just tell everybody about this conversation. We have to expand the love, the grace, and the play. Yes. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, I would love to hear your voice. Uh, uh, Dr. Donaldson also would love to hear your voice. So go to our website in Parenting the Gods and type in your comments on this conversation. How is how you play with children? What is what you have learned from children? Have you experienced this, what he's describing? This grace, this love, this expansion, this light while you're playing with your children? Please do comment because you never know, maybe your comment is going to touch the life of somebody else and okay. those people need it. Yeah. And once you're there, join our mailing list because there I share things that I cannot share in video. <laughs> okay. And I want to thank you, everybody. I want to thank you, Dr. Donaldson, for being here with us. And uh, remember, the only language your children understand is love. Speak from love, act from love. Be loved.